Alex here with part 216 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's a video that contains a detailed disclaimer and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are number one, not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my access parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series <clears throat> is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We go into the new Supreme Court case, this time for the judge's order denying costs. My mindset was mostly positive. I figured it was going to be an open and shut appeal. I figured that it wasn't going to take a whole lot of effort, and I was right. Mostly, I just copy-pasted my arguments from the motion. And um, I had already, at this point, done so many docketing statements and transcript request forms that it was virtually effortless for me. And so it was interesting to get to the point where I could appeal the decision of a judge and it take me so little of my time to do that. I mean, I think I was done with the entire appeal within an hour and a half or two hours. And it's not a big appeal. You guys are going to see the, the opening brief is going to be like three pages. Um, and it's just very different from when I first, you know, had to go to the Supreme Court. It's at this point something that I'm very comfortable with doing. And it's not like I'm wasting their time because they will overturn the judge's decision. It's going to be a successful appeal, which means that intervention was not only warranted, it was necessary. Um, I think all that being said, we should really just go straight into what I have filed. the docketing statement. We've gone through quite a few of these and I'm almost to the point where I just want to skip them, but I won't. I'm going to skip the portions of it that really aren't legal. Like for example, on this page you're just filling in which district, what county, judge's name, case number, stuff that really d doesn't require my attention. Um, attorneys filing which there aren't any on my behalf or on my ex's behalf. Okay, so this is um, probably relevant special or the nature of disposition and this is a special order after judgment if you guys want to learn more about this term please watch my video on the topic special order after judgment if you're in Nevada it's like 100% mandatory must watch video um, anyway the type of what it is you're appealing controls whether or not you even can appeal and there are different reasons for and as you can see there's all these different checkboxes um, check spot <laughs> check boxes and then there is this other category which is for sort of weird situations which is it's weird to say it's a weird situation because in child custody cases it happens i think more often than not but i've explained before how child custody situations are nothing like ordinary court cases which have a clear beginning middle and end child custody cases do not have a clear end and many of them do this this sort of thing where the case is closed but a bunch of motions to modify get filed for years and years on end which to any other area of law is strange but in child custody it just seems to be what happens um anyway they don't have a classification for what i'm trying to do so i have to mark the other disposition box and put special order and i explain all the details in the video special order after judgment does this appeal raise issues concerning of child custody. I didn't mark the child custody box because even though it's a child custody case, the only issue before the court is costs. It's just money. Pending in prior proceedings in this court, I just put down the other appeal that was reversed. Weren't, they, weren't there more though? This is the case number and docket number of appeals or original proceedings presently or previously before. So maybe I thought presently Possibly that's what I was thinking because there's a bunch of previous appeals that I should have listed Pending in prior proceedings in other courts. So I have the child custody case here. I should have probably included the child support enforcement case Oh, no, because they want they want to know what's related to this appeal only I get it. Okay 
uh, nature of the action. So I describe that my that I prevailed on appeal when I prevail on appeal when an appellant prevails on appeal. The procedure for taxing costs is bifurcated between the court and the trial. This court and the trial court, which is true. I move for costs in this court and in the trial court. This court awarded costs. The trial court refused, and my appeal follows. Issues on appeal: whether I'm entitled to costs. Pending proceedings in this court that are raising the same issues, none that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, it's not usual, I think, for a proper person litigants to really know what's going on with you know the Supreme Court. Lawyers might. You know, they might know there's like other different types of cases that are relevant to this case that are on appeal and they can list those out. But if you're not, a, if you're a non-attorney, you're not going to really know probably what's going on um, with all the other cases that are in front of them. And as far as I know, there's no easy way to search that. Constitutional issues. Um, is the appeal challenging the constitutionality of a statute? And the state or any state agency or any officer or employee thereof is not a party to the appeal. I'm not sure what they mean by this. In any event, I think I probably should have marked no, not N-A. Um, other issues. Does this appeal involve any of the following? And it doesn't. Um, issue of public policy would be something that's important to like the state as a sort of, of measure that's going to control the way that the state deals with a situation with the entire population. First impression issue is something that the court's never dealt with before. You know, these are, these are just kind of areas that should make your appeal stand out. And so they're used by the Supreme Court to determine whether or not they're going to hold on to your appeal and not send it to the Court of Appeals. Or possibly if they think they're going to need to publish your appeal. Um, and for my case, it's just a regular old appeal from a, ju a, a judge just making a generic mistake that they just shouldn't have made. There's nothing remarkable about my appeal. It's just a mistake that the judge... It's, it's an obvious error. So there's no reason to keep it in the Supreme Court. There's no reason to publish it. Assignment to the Court of Appeals, and I'm saying that this matter is presumptively assigned to the Court of Appeals. If you want to learn more about routing, you have to read uh, Rule 17 of the Rules of Appellate Procedure, and that just explains what goes to the Supreme Court. Sorry, I should clarify. That just explains what stays in the Supreme Court and what gets pushed down to the Court of Appeals. Trial. There was none. She just denied my, my motion summarily without a, a hearing. A judicial disqualification. This is if you want to recuse one of the justices of the Supreme Court, and I, you know, I didn't have any kind of connections with any of them, so I just said no. Timeliness of the notice of appeal. So they're looking here to see if you're late. So the, <laughs> which in this case I'm not, since I filed the notice of appeal literal hours after I got the order. So June 23rd. Oh, wait. No, yeah, that's right. June 23rd is the written judgment or order I'm appealing from. And then July 26th is when I filed a notice of entry, which it doesn't matter because I filed the notice of appeal way before. Is the time for filing the notice of appeal told? I think I have a video on tolling. I'm not sure if I do or not. Uh, mention down in the comments below if you'd like to learn more about tolling. I probably talk about it in the video filing an appeal anyway. Um, but yeah, there are certain things that you can file that will toll the time limit to file the appeal. And what they mean by that is that, let's say you have 30 days to file the appeal and somebody files one of those tolling things, tolling motions, whatever. Um, well, your 30 days now gets bumped to when that issue that they have filed is resolved. So let's say they file like a motion for new trial and then um, it gets you know, resolved by the court like three weeks, four weeks later, well, the time limit to file the appeal would actually get moved to the date of that other order dealing with that other motion. To some things are tolling and some things are not. So it's very important that you know which things are and aren't because you can you could make a mistake and think that something's been filed that tolls to file, you know, tolls the time limit to file the appeal. And it actually doesn't. And then when you file your notice of appeal, the Supreme Court will say you're late and they'll dismiss. Motions made pursuant to Rule 60 motions. Yes, yeah, so this kind of stuff. That's interesting that they put a note here. It's very interesting because I've talked about this before in the video, Motions for Reconsideration, and it looks like this is the case, AA Primo Builders versus Washington, that explains whether or not these motions do or don't toll, which is very important to learn about because somebody files a motion for reconsideration and you find out it doesn't toll, well, there goes your chance to appeal. Uh, date of uh, date the notice of appeal was filed is June 23rd. Specify the statute or rule governing the time limit, which is in this case Rule 4 sub A1. Substantive appealability. We have 
Rule 3A sub B8. I think this is the one that talks about special orders after judgment. You guys can check it out if you want to. Explain how the authority provides a basis for appeal, and then I typed in the trial court denied a post-judgment motion. An order denying cost constitutes a special order after judgment. And that's this case here that states that. Parties involved, myself and my ex. Brief description of the claims. <clears throat> I move for costs, and the court summarily denied my motion. Did the judgment or order appeal that you're appealing from adjudicate all claims? Yes. Did the court certify the judgment or order? No. Does it matter? I wonder, I really want to learn more about what this is and how it works. I've heard of this being used in other types of cases. Um, did the district court make an express determination pursuant to Rule 54 sub B that there is no reason to justify a lay? I see again I don't I don't know as far as I know family courts don't really ever talk about rule 54 sub B I've never seen it before I would love to learn more about that if you answered no explain the basis and then I'm just saying the order is independently appealable as a special order after judgment and then we got these stamped copies that I've attached after this um, document which I'm not going to go over because we've already gone through them in the my docket series verification I'm just verifying under penalty of perjury that everything in here is true and correct Certificate of service indicating this document was mailed to my ex. And then we have the things that were attached. Uh, as my standard policy with the My Docket series, I don't go over documents that have already gone over in the My Docket series. All of these documents have already gone over. Um, if you want to see for yourself, take a look down in the description below. Click on the link, download the docketing statement for yourself. And if you think I missed something, just mention it down in the comments below. Notice of potential dismissal for failing or for failure to pay the Supreme Court filing fee. I did pay the filing fee like a day or two after I got this notice. I think I think the reason why they sent this is because I paid it directly to the Supreme Court and not to the district court. Because they're usually expecting to get it from the district court, like it gets mailed up with all your paperwork. Um, in any event, it was paid. Instructions, notice regarding deadlines. This is just the generic pro se instructions that they give to somebody who's representing themselves. It explains to them how all of these timelines work for filing all these documents. A certificate that no transcript is being requested. This is me just telling the Supreme Court that I do not intend to request transcripts because none exist. The court did not hold a hearing, therefore there are no transcripts. No hearing means it's cheaper. I've always explained this to people. I don't know why people want a hearing just because like I feel like people just think it's going to like make their case for them that they can talk to the judge face to face. I'm not I'm not convinced at all. If the judge does not want to grant my paperwork, I'm not going to be able to change their mind at a hearing. I just don't believe that. I'm not an attorney. Even I don't even know if attorneys are able to pull it off that often. In any event, it makes it cheaper for me to get their decision overturned on appeal when they just deny it on paperwork because then I don't have to order transcripts. I don't have to wait. It's just quicker, faster, cheaper. And so in that in that sense, I actually appreciate the judge is just denying it on the paperwork makes it a lot easier for me to fix her mistake um opening brief so here come the legal arguments oh looks like i did the first page the way i was supposed to i think i've mentioned before guys with my other opening briefs that i don't that i didn't set up that first page correctly this is the way that uh, an opening brief is supposed to look i'm not sure why or who makes these rules or where it comes from lawyers are going to have better answers for that but i've noticed that this is the way that they expect an appeals opening brief to look table of contents which is required under the rules of appellate procedure. If you want to know more about what the table of contents needs to look like, the table of authorities, which contains the rules and the statutes and the cases that you're going to cite, um, you'll learn about that in the rules of appellate procedure because in Nevada, it specifically mentions that these things are required. Same thing with your Rule 26.1 disclosure. This is like a thing that they really want, well, not really want, that they mandate corporations and, and um, large business entities to provide. They want to know who owns um, who's the parent corporation of the corporation that's involved in the appeal? They want to know those kinds of details. And so, so sorry, rule um, 26.1 explains that. <clears throat> Routing statement, this is what I talked about with rule 17. This is just stating to the Supreme Court that this should be presumptively assigned to the Court of Appeals. Jurisdictional statement. This is the statement that lets the Supreme Court know why they have jurisdiction to even hear the case. 
And there's a few basic principles behind that. Number one, the order is dispositive, which means that all of the issues were disposed of. Sometimes the court will enter an order that only deals with some of the issues and leaves the other ones up in the air. And when that occurs, that's not a dispositive order. Um, the order is appealable based on Rule 3A sub B8, which talks about post-judgment orders awarding attorney fees um, of being appealable as a special order after judgment. It's actually not just the rule, but also the, the GNLV Corp that goes into that detail. I'm aggrieved by the order, which is contemplated by Rule 3A sub A. Um, if you're not aggrieved, you can't appeal. Sometimes the court will enter an order that's appealable, but you didn't lose. And I'm not sure why some people want to appeal. Um, or maybe it's another person that has nothing to do with the appeal. That person's also not aggrieved. Um, in any event, that's discussed in Bates v. Nevada Savings and Loan Association. Original jurisdiction established in the Second Judicial District Court, which is me saying that the court that originally heard this matter is Second Judicial District, because the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction over all of these districts, not just one. And then we have the dispositive order was rendered June 23rd, 2017. And the notice of appeal was timely. Statement of the issues. We have the court erred in denying my motion for costs. That's it. It's the only issue. Statement of the case. The district court imposed an attorney fee award as a sanction in favor of my ex and against me. I appealed. The matter was transferred to the court of appeals and disposed of by order reversing. I moved for costs in this court and the lower court. This court gave me costs. The lower court refused. I'm entitled to an award of costs. The lower court messed up. Statement of the facts. Court of Appeal, actually this is more so state uh, procedural history, not a statement of the facts, but in any event, the Court of Appeal reversed the decision on March 14th, 2017. I filed a motion for costs, and the lower court denied. You can see how this appeal is pretty simple. Summary of argument, this appeal is focused on questions of statutory construction concerning a single rule and a single statute. If you guys want to learn more about statutory construction, please watch my video on the topic, Statutory Construction. It's one of the most important videos I think I can recommend. When an appeal is resolved by an order reversing a decision of the trial court, the appellant is entitled to an award of costs. This is precisely what occurred in Supreme Court number 69341. Accordingly, the district court erred and denied my motion. Argument, I prevailed on appeal. There's my order reversing. The procedure for awarding costs is split between this court and the lower court. The court awarded costs, this court specifically awarded costs, and the lower court refused. The district court's award of costs will not be disturbed on appeal unless the district court abused its discretion. An abusive discretion is, quote, a clear ignoring by the court of applicable legal principles without apparent justification, unquote, which is what this judge did. The issue before this court is one of statutory construction, and I love questions of statutory interpretation because those questions are questions of law, which are subject to de novo review. If you want to learn more about why that is so important, watch my video on the topic, standard of review. Unless the law provides otherwise, costs are taxed against the respondent if a judgment is reversed, and that's Rule 39, Sub A3. In denying my request for costs, the district court relied on Statute 18.060, a statute which this court has set affords the district court no discretion. And that's explained in Kiever v. Jewelry Mountain Mines, Incorporated. In this, oh, by the way, if you want to watch my video on the topic, discretion, Good idea. In this case, it is clear from the district court's order denying costs that it is considered that the sorry that it considered the Kiever court's discussion and applied 18.060. However, the district court erred because it either number one erroneously applied the converse of the language of the statute. I'm giving the judge too much credit here. And number two, misunderstood its lack of discretion under the statute to compel the denial of costs when in actuality it compels the awarding of costs. Yeah. I mean, I, I think she just pulled a stunt. The district court denied my motion for costs because the Nevada Court of Appeals did not modify the judgment. What? The language of 18.060 sub 2 provides that, quote, the cost of an appeal shall be in the discretion of the court when a judgment is modified, unquote. The district court's own conclusion supports my argument, namely that 18.060 sub 2 does not control and that as per the statute, quote, the party obtaining any relief shall have his or her costs, unquote. And that's 18.060. I'm basically using the judge's own words against her. Furthermore, appellant takes this opportunity to point out that the Court of Appeals order reversing the decision in SCN 69-341 is not distinguishable from how this court reversed the decision in Kiever v. Jewelry Mountain Mines. It's the same thing. And if this court found the award of costs clear, emphatic, and peremptory in Kiever, it should certainly find the same in the matter before this court now.
So we got rule 25 sub D certificate of service, which is the same thing as rule five under the rules of civil procedure. It's just that in the rules of appellate procedure, it's in a different spot. It's actually not identical, but it's mostly the same. I'm indicating that this document was mailed to my ex. Motion to retain one opening brief and strike the other. I guess what happened was I filed two opening briefs. One of them was missing the Rule 26.1 disclosure and the other one wasn't. So I just asked this Supreme Court to make sure that it keeps the brief that has the Rule 26.1 disclosure and discards the other one. And then I'm indicating that I mailed this document to my ex as well. Here we have Justice Michael Cherry ordering the lower court to transmit the entire record to the Supreme Court. They have stated that they have reviewed the documents that I filed in my appeal, and they, they have come to the conclusion that their review of the complete record is warranted. Accordingly, within 30 days from the date of the order, they are directing the district court clerk to transmit everything to the Supreme Court clerk. We have another order from Justice Michael Cherry, <clears throat> and he is doing as I asked. He is striking the opening brief filed on August 2nd, and he is accepting the opening brief filed on August 7th. Much appreciated. Going into the aftermath, I filed one, two, three, four documents. They were all free filing, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex did not file anything, so she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex didn't have an attorney either, so she incurred zero dollars in attorney fees as well. As my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.